Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Sporty's latest webinar on flying aerobatics with Patty Wagstaff. I want to welcome everyone and thank you for your time today to enjoy the presentation from one of our and my personal favorite guests uh, that we have here at Sporty's on all different types of presentations, and that is world famous aerobatic and air, uh, air show performer Patty Wagstaff. I'm going to give a quick overview of our presentation before jumping into Patty who is coming live to us from uh, her flight school and, and home airport in St. Augustine, Florida. Quick uh, presentation overview, I'm gonna cover introduction to aerobatics to learn more about the uh, this type of flying, what aerobatic flying looks like today, aerobatic airplanes, and of course some talk on aerobatic air shows, which Patty knows better than any, uh, anyone out there, how to start flying aerobatics, and we'll wrap up with a Q&A with Patty. So I'm behind the scenes here at Sporty's Pilot Shop. My name is Brett Kobe. I'm a video producer, oversee a lot of the training content development at Sporty's. Have had the honor to work with Patty over the last five years as we've developed several courses and a nice collaboration. Uh, first one we did was a basic aerobatics course. And then uh, the last couple of years, we did a tailwheel training course, uh, which Patty will talk a little bit about later. But the star of the show today is Patty herself. Uh, welcome, Patty. How are you? I'm good, thanks. I'm not sure if people can see me yet or not, but um, welcome everybody and thank you for your interest in aerobatics and thanks for having me. Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, I know you are at your flight school, is that correct, in uh, St. Augustine? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm here by myself. Everybody left. We got a lot of flying done today already and um, and so I'm in my office and uh, with my dogs and I'm hoping they don't bark. Huh. They might want to make a cameo later, and we won't uh, we won't be mad if they do. I know okay. you like to fly with your dogs as you travel to air shows across the country. They go everywhere with me. I can't help it. You know, what do I do with them? Have to, have to take them. <laughs> Good problem to have. Well, yeah. Patty barely needs an introduction, but I, it wouldn't be right if I don't give some background info for those uh, the new to the aviation world and some highlights from Patty that many may not know about that she'll also talk about and mix in <laughs> with her presentation. Uh, but of course, first and foremost, air show pilot performer. Experienced tailwheel uh, pilot, flight school owner. Uh, we'll talk about her flight school and how you can actually fly with Patty and her team of excellent aerobatic instructors. A six time member of the US aerobatic team, first woman to win the title of US national aerobatic champion, and one of the few people to win it three times. Pretty impressive. She'll be performing this year, as she has many years in the past, at uh, air shows across the US, including Oshkosh again this year at EAA. Patty's also a bush pilot. I actually learned to fly in Alaska, which I'm looking forward to hearing more about later on, and is actively flying with the Kenya Wildlife Service. Uh, she was just over in Africa not too long ago, and has uh, done a stint with firefighting support operations in California. So well-rounded and has really seen all sides of aviation, professionally and uh, recreationally. As I mentioned, she operates a school in St. Augustine, Florida, Patty Wagstaff Aviation Safety, where they operate a extra 300 and decathlon, uh, actively teaching tailwheel, upset recovery training, and of course, full aerobatics in those two airplanes. And I want to mention this briefly before I hand it over to Patty, uh, for learning more about this topic. And, you know, as you kind of think about taking the next step, we have produced a course together, the basic aerobatics with Patty Wagstaff, which is a great way to learn more about the stick and rudder and, and controls and see what it's really like from a video perspective. Uh, we shot with Patty and all her different airplanes and a great way to ride along and, and learn more about this exciting topic. So, Patty, I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of talk about an introduction to aerobatics and why you really encourage pilots of all skill levels to do so. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, aerobatics over the past years, I think, has gotten a little bit of a bad reputation. Um, they, when people... I mean, we're trying to change that, of course, but when people heard the word aerobatics a few years ago, uh, oh my God, those crazy stunt pilots, or it's crazy. Flying. They didn't really understand the benefit and the value of it for every general aviation pilot and every pilot, whether they fly GA or corporate or even airlines. And, um, you know, backing up just slightly, in World War II, it was required to do aerobatics before you soloed. Um, after World War II, most uh, instructors taught it. You know, they were teaching small tail draggers and things like that. And the instructors that came from World War II understood the value of aerobatics. And even if they couldn't teach it, they would teach some more extreme flying. Well, that changed, you know, after the 50s, things changed. And uh, a lot of manufacturers uh, wanted to present airplanes as not, not aerobatic planes and, and airplanes that could fly like a car. 
And if you look at all the old ads from Beechcraft, Cessna, all, you know, the, Piper, the manufacturers of the time, it was uh, showing a, a guy usually in a suit, walking up to the plane with this briefcase and, and, you know, pushing a button and flying it like a car. That's how they tried to market it. And that sort of trickled down to the instructors and the, you know, of course, the training airplanes. Um, so aerobatics became sort of a bad word. And to me, it's always been an exciting word. And, you know, I couldn't wait to do it, but I'm, that's me, you know, but um, overall, I think it did. And so um, in the meantime, there, there have been a lot of really good instructors out there that really tried to change change that culture a little bit and and let people know that aerobatics was value to pilots and that people used to do aerobatics before they soloed. And, and so, uh, and I don't want to go on too long about it, but um, just for an example, I grew up with a father who had learned to fly um, in the Army Air Corps, and he and I used to listen to him and his friends all the time because I was fascinated by it from a young age. And and if you had, there was no word back then for unusual attitude or an upset or anything like that. They had all learned aerobatics. They didn't think anything of it. They knew that they could handle anything. And of course, it's gotten way far away from that. So they had different problems back then, you know, navigation, weather, that type of stuff. So um, we really want to change that. Um, Part of what's changing that culture, I think, is the value of upset training. Um, APS, um, Aviation Performance Solutions, I think, um, in Arizona, they really pioneered upset training in this country and probably in the world. By um, they, they understood that people felt, you know, intimidated by aerobatics. So uh, upset training is a little different than aerobatics, and I can go into that, but it. Um, it, it really gives people an introduction to, you know, how, how do I fix an unusual attitude? How do I get out of it? How can I become a safer pilot? And by the way, here's an introduction to aerobatics. So it's all sort of tied into one. And I think because of that, aerobatics isn't such a bad word anymore. And I think people are really be, being able to see the value of it. So that's just a little background. <laughs> and no, that's great. So, and, you know, I can talk about this stuff uh, ad infinitum because it's my life. But um, so the question, should I learn aerobatics if I have no intention of flying competitions or air shows? Yes, absolutely. Most of our students, we have a lot of students and most of our students, we send them out a questionnaire ahead of time and we say, you know, why do you want to learn this? What's your, you know, what's your motivation? And 90% of them, except for some advanced students that have already been doing this, are I want to become a safer, better pilot. And that's exactly what you learn when you when you learn upset training or aerobatics. Um, you learn how to control your plane in all axes. Um, you know, we don't, and no school is going to do this. They don't throw you into these aerobatic maneuvers and expect you to do all this stuff right away. You're going to learn, you know, basic airmanship, you know, climb, steep climbs, and then, then a loop, you know, roll, and, you know, basic, basic stuff. And so... Um, and some people don't even go further than that. They just do one day or two days at a school. But um, it really gives a student a lot of um, a lot of confidence. They get improved situational awareness, just like on the slide here. Um, we teach people to learn to learn to use their controls independently. Sometimes you just need aileron. Sometimes you just need a little rudder. And most people can't even do that um, after they've been flying for a while. Um, they learn energy management, um, and I like this better ability to make decisions is absolutely right. They become really the master of their craft, and that's the way I like to feel. I like to feel like I'm the master of the universe. I get in my plane. I know what's going to happen, and with, you know, with aerobatic or upset training, it gives you that much more confidence knowing that whatever comes your way, you can recover from. It's really important. You don't have to go into it for a, you know, for a career. I mean, very few people become air show pilots, and those people are so driven you couldn't stop them. It's just a funny thing, you know, it's like a calling. Um, most people really enjoy it. Um, I haven't seen anybody that didn't love it. Um, and we have this little thing on our T-shirt that says hashtag not responsible for your addiction because a lot of people get addicted. And, and pretty quickly too, they're like, you know, I was really afraid to do this. And now that you've taught me where to look in the plane, what we're gonna be doing, what the control in, inputs are in the ground, and I go up and do it in a safe airplane, I feel really good with this instructor. They're like, this is great, I really love it. So um, just that is benefit in itself, expanding your envelope in a safe way and, and um, um, improving, just improving your skills and giving you more confidence. And then ultimately, 
um, enjoying flying more. And that's kind of my goal is I want you to have fun and go fly more because GA is important and I don't want to see it go away. So I know a lot of people that don't don't fly much because they really don't get the training. They're kind of intimidated. They they can't read the weather and you know they you need to go out and expand your horizons a little bit. One of my favorite lines I've heard you say is the concept of what if uh, in talking with a Cirrus pilot or a Learjet pilot who might fly their family for fun on a vacation or fly professionally. Um, what do you mean by that concept of what if and what you can learn, even if you don't tend to ever get in an unusual attitude, which most of us yeah, don't if I, we're not at your school? Um, I really like that. I When I first started flying, I couldn't find anybody to teach me aerobatics. It took a while. I was in Alaska and there weren't any aerobatic instructors. and and the whole time I was thinking, what if, you know, what if I get in a spin and you know, nobody wanted to do that? And, um, you know, what if I get into, you know, some weird situation here? And, and uh, you know, I was flying around mountains and, and you know, pretty extreme place. Um, so I, that was always in my mind. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to take aerobatic lessons, which, you know, of course I finally did. But um, I think that Every pilot has that. And if you don't have it, you know, you should have it. You should have a little fear for what if, you know, what what if I get into wake turbulence? Um, what if I get into, you know, I get too close to the mountains? What if the plane drops on its side and, you know, I don't know how to recover from it? And if you have that in the back of your mind, the whole time when you're going to be flying, there's some fear, there's some intimidation. You might not even go fly. Um, so get, you know, get past that. Find out you know, just get a one day upset training course. Um, that's all you really, that's all you have to do to to understand how to, you know, the techniques for recovering from these things. You will find that you are so much more comfortable and confident in your plane. And I guarantee you'll have more fun and enjoy it more and be safer, of course. That's great advice. Uh, so I have a slide up here. I think that the top picture, that's at the Cathlon. Is that correct? Is that a Cathlon, you know, we bought that for $22,000 in Alaska. And uh, he, anybody that knows what they cost now would, you know, I think they're like 300 new now. So, um, and we bought it there. We didn't have a hangar. And in the winter, we just have to go, if the snow got really deep, we'd go go out to the airport with a broom and, you know, push the snow off. And um, yeah, so if I wanted to fly it in the winter, I had to, you know, preheat it. I had a Tannis engine heater on it and we'd plug it in. And <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I learned a lot in that airplane. I really did. And I flew that down to the States for my first contest. I love that plane's still flying, by the way, somewhere. So that's cool. How did you transition then into the extra and the higher performance airplanes? I went from that to a single seat pits to an S1S. Um, and then I went from an S1S to an S1T that had a constant speed prop and a little bit different wing, I think. I'm not sure. I can't remember that. But um, similar, but a little different, a little more horsepower. 200 instead of 180. Um, and then from there, I went to the S2S, which is a 180, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a 300 horsepower single uh, single seat pits. And that's what all these planes like like Skip Stewart and guys like that that modify their pits is they're all based on the S2S. And then, um, then I went to the 230, which is in the slide below, which was the first production airplane that Walter Extra made. And it was really the first production airplane that you could buy um and it was it was sold by pompano air center in the states and clint mchenry um kind of was my mentor uh, all along and he um he invited me to fly his airplane and i flew that and said oh my god it's it's amazing it's like flying through oil or grease it's so smooth the controls <laughs> were so smooth. and i said i have to have one of these and um so sold the pits and bought one of those and Back then, that plane, brand new, cost eighty thousand dollars, and that's and right now to buy that plane's still flying, by the way, too. And to buy that airplane, you probably pay pay more than that for it right now. That same plane. I, I bet. <laughs> uh, I was in Washington D.C. not too long ago at the Smithsonian, and I believe I saw one of your airplanes hanging there as well. Yeah, at the mall. Um, it's upside down, and I haven't seen the new location yet. But it's in a it's in a really great location apparently, and um, people have been sending me pictures. It's hanging up in a hallway next to Jackie Cochran's T T thirty eight that she broke the sound barrier in, and Jackie fascinates me. So I'm in a great spot. Maybe that's maybe I'll. Yeah. <laughs> that's great company. Let's uh yeah. let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, so as we get into talking about the actual aerobatic flying itself, and you know we you offer the classes and the the uh, courseware there, and somebody gets the bug and they want to keep flying aerobatics, uh, 
talk a little bit about you know what what the process is in, in the lesson at your school and then what are the next steps after you get comfortable flying some of those basic maneuvers well you know everybody has different motivations and some people come you know it's something they've always wanted to do and they don't know what they want to do you know they just know that they want to try it and after they you know take a few hours of aerobatic lessons and you know we start very simple and then we work into loops and rolls and you know very simple stuff half cubans and all the all the stuff that's really our five hour course is all the stuff that's in the sporties video and the basic aerobatics video and after that we go into a little bit more advanced if they're taking a 10 hour course so um, a little more advanced with some verticals, hammerheads, and things like that. And we kind of get them up to a sportsman level routine where they can, and we're really where they can actually solo. Oh, and that's on the next slide. So about 10 hours is a good benchmark for solo. Anything less than that, you really don't make enough mistakes to, you know, to feel like you've done everything. Um, everybody's different. I, I just got a text from a student who has a scout and he's flying it up to Maine for the summer and he got back to his uh you know to his house and he texted me and said should i sell my scout and get a decathlon <laughs> after the lessons you know and he hadn't done aerobatics before and i said well just go go sell, fly your scout a little bit and then see how you feel you know because right now you're just, you know you're chomping at the bit and you know whether he wants to continue i don't know so but um people really fall in love with this stuff and um it's you know again 10 hours can you know work your way up to it and then you know it really depends on where you want to go with it what kind of plane you want to have and how much money you have to spend of course is the big thing that's a great uh great lesson in all of aviation right you get uh you get uh, fascinated with one aspect and money's your only yeah. uh <laughs> your limit at that point a lot of times it can be, yeah it, it really can be now you know if you want if you especially if you have a family or you know you actually want some retirement money and you know all that stuff and unless you're an air show pilot <laughs> and you're right. so, you know all your money goes into the airplanes and you don't think about that other stuff um <laughs> but uh yeah th there are different ways to do it i mean i i'm partners in um we have an rv6 and our chief instructor and his wife and i his he and his wife and myself are partners in the plane it's fabulous our our our, in, our costs are so low you know hangar annual Costs us nothing because we're partners in it, and um, you know, so it, it's a really great way to, if you find the right partner. That's very important, but it's really, it's really inexpensive. It's silly how inexpensive it is when you have the right partner. So right, and RV uh, airplanes in general are really impressive outside of aerobatics, just for their performance and efficiency. But oh, the cool. fact you can take the same airplane you fly, you know, as your transportation, you can also go out and do a full aerobatic routine in it, also. Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, for sure, some there are, you're going to see that at Oshkosh, so some you see, uh, like, the Red Line team, and, and they're, I, who, I think maybe Jive Kirby is going to fly there, they both, they have RV8s, and, and they're going to do full-on routine, so, now, you know, I wouldn't say it's for everybody to go and do that, you really have to know what you're doing, but uh, once in a while, going cross-country, I'll roll my, roll the RV, so, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a great airplane, though. it's fast, it's economical, it's not, you know they're not built to be aerobatic competition planes so uh, people should know that you know it's not a full-on aerobatic plane but it's a fun airplane that you can do some basic aerobatics in for sure but um yeah at fast economical it's crazy how great these airplanes are they really are uh, so talk to us a little bit about the competitive aerobatic flying and and how much fun that can be not from a air show performance level but still a competition to really maximize your skills, perfect your craft, and then compete against other aerobatic pilots? So if a student comes that owns a decathlon or they're going to buy one and, and um, or has access to one and says, well, now what do I do? You know, they've taken a course and they're ready. You know, they want to keep doing aerobatics. I said, you need to find some people in your area um, or, you know, join IEC. I always try, you know, give them a, a brochure and say, please join International Aerobatic Club, which is IEC.org. Uh, it's a great, um, it's a it's a division of EAA, and it's a fantastic organization. They have a lot of safety information, a lot of safety articles. You get a um, newsletter, you get a little magazine. I mean, it's it's that's how I find out about aerobatics. So I was sitting in an FBO with my husband. It was like I just got my license, and 
I'd never seen aerobatics. I'd never been to an air show. I was just still new that I, even as a kid, I used to like, what are aerobatics, you know? And so, uh, you know, I'm a little strange, but so I'm sitting in this FBO and he's looking at an airplane and I pick up a copy of their magazine, right? Sport aerobatics. I'm like, look, 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 this is crazy. There's a whole organization for this stuff. So um, competition's great. People are very, very nice They They want to bring you into the fold. Um, so, but backing up, if I tell a student, you know, well, you should go try a competition now. And they're like, I'm not good enough to compete. I'm like, yeah, you are, you know, there's a primary level. It's a very basic and you can do it. You're, you've already done it. So I suggest they go to a contest, meet some people, volunteer, everybody volunteers, um, sit on the judges line, listen to the judges and just find out what a cool group it is and how nice the people are. And they will tell you everything you need to know and then go back and try it. And that's how most people start. That's kind of how I started too. And um, this weekend there was a contest in Virginia and Warrington and I saw at least four of my students competing there and um, at least two of them brought home some hardware and it was so exciting. It was really, really cool. So that was I, neat. Yeah. You know, we always joke pilots about, you know, who's the better pilot and who had the better landing, but this is really objective, right? Good Measured good by good. judges. <laughs> yeah no it's it's fun it's fun we all tease you you know people joke it's it's just a great time you know you're, you're like yeah i saw your landing haha ha. and nobody's you know it's not it's not uber competitive by any means the only time it gets uber competitive at all and even then it's still pretty laid back is in the unlimited level you know at the world championship or something you know but even then it's pretty pretty friendly and fun that's cool uh, okay, so moving on to the next level, which you by far are probably the best person to talk about this is the air show flying. And air shows. Kind of <laughs> you know, this is my 39th year of flying air shows. I, I didn't realize that until a couple of days ago when I, somebody asked me, I'm like, I don't know. I don't like to think I just do it. You know? And then I counted it and I'm like 39 years since my first air show. So there you go. So I do know a little bit about air shows. Well, congratulations on that. <laughs> Thanks um yeah so you want me to talk about airship line from here yeah uh, i think it's kind of an interesting kind of look into you know your mindset and how you've taken everything you've learned to really take it to the ultimate level and and sh uh, show and, and for a lot of different reasons you know your enjoyment but also to bring people into aviation also at these big events well air shows are the best place for people to see airplanes and learn about aviation and get exposed to aviation all of us who've flown air shows for any length of time get letters and emails from kids that say, I saw you fly in your show 10 years ago, and that's what sparked my interest, you know? And um, it, I hear that all the time. And so, you know, and I tell people, look, you can't walk up to an airport and walk up to the airplane and, you know, touch it because they'll probably arrest you. Um, but in air show, they have all these static, you know, planes on static display. You can go up, the pilots will talk to you. Maybe you can sit in the plane. Um, you can be, get exposed to aviation. Um, you can smell the smoke, you know, you can see the airplanes fly. It's super exciting. It's super fun. Um, it's a great way to get exposed to aviation. It's, and it's the only way most people, not everybody grew up around, you know, aviation like I did. Um, and so if you've never been around it, how do you even know about it? So that's that's what is so important about air shows and we talk to thousands of people people like that did somebody i know the other day said well what kind of outreach do you do it shows you gotta like you know do you go out and talk to people i'm like well i stand on the fence and i walk down the fence and i talk to like a thousand people and huh. give them tours, you know so we do a lot so the whole thing is outreach right absolutely sure they'll seem like anything special but we all do that so um Air shows, however, are dangerous compared to co competition for the pilots. It's 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 not um, it it can be it, it's dangerous, you know. And and if you say that it's not to the pilot, then you're doing them a disservice. You know, it takes a lot of skill, a lot of practice, a lot of training, and you really have to understand your limitations and work up to it. It's not something where you have the money to buy a really hot airplane and you go out and fly, you know because that's kind of a recipe for disaster. So if you do it right and you compete first, you know, all the top airshow pilots have competed or are still competing, just about all of them. There, there are a few that don't, but they were brought up in, you know, airshow families and they've learned this since they were kids. 
but um, you have to have a statement of aerobatic competency and it starts high at 800 feet. Then you get, then, and this is done by an evaluator. Like I'm an evalu air show evaluator. I'll watch somebody and say, okay, you know, you're okay at that level, blah, blah, blah. And then you go to 250 feet and then you go to surface level, which is really hard to do. And you have to play a lot of shows at each level. So it's kind of a stepping stone process. And, um, and it's, it's good. Um, the, um, you know, it works pretty well um, because we're able to really monitor people. And when you have an ACE, like the aerobatic competency evaluator, they're kind of your mentor. You can call them up. You can, you know, I see, I've see i seen people, I saw one of my, um, uh, a person I aced, and I had told him not to do this maneuver too low about three times. And I said, you know, it's it's not the way to do it. It makes me worried. And he said, oh, yeah, I'll fix it. I'll fix it. And one day I was sitting, <laughs> this is funny, I was sitting at home, and I was looking at Twitter. I didn't have an air show that weekend. And there's the student doing this maneuver and they're in like Wyoming or Idaho. I think they're in Idaho. And I saw it on Twitter. And so I texted him immediately and I said, stop doing that so low. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, what, are you here? I said, no, I just see everything. And um, it was funny. So we know, you know, we're, we keep in touch. It's a small group. Right. Um, and there's a group, uh, we have a group too, it's uh, other than IEC, it's International Council of Air Shows and everything sort of goes, funnels through them. And the picture on the slide below the plane is my statement of, or somebody's statement of aerobatic competency. And um, um, that's what the FAA sent to you because ultimately it is approved by the FAA. We, we recommend to the FAA and they send you this thing and you have to have it with you at every show. And we get ramp checked, you know, big time at every show with all our paperwork. And um, so, um, and you have to renew how often you have to renew certain categories. So I might have five categories like warbirds, jets, blah, 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 to fly low level. But if I don't renew those, say in five years, you know, for example, I have to go back and redo it, you know? So it's, it's, um, what I tell new people when they call me and ask me if I'll evaluate them, I say, have you flown competition? And they go, yeah. And I say, have you flown advanced category, which brings you down to 500 feet. And if they say no, I say, call me after you've successfully flown advanced and, um, you know, did okay in it. You don't have to win, but, you know, fly it. Um, flying competition shows that you can take criticism for one thing. That's super important. You have to have, you have to leave your ego on the ground when you go fly. and um, that they can keep it in a small airspace, like competitions in a small, very small airspace. Um, so that's important. Uh, it shows that you understand energy management and that you have discipline. So all those things. And and the biggie is really that you can take criticism, you know. So if you can do that and you can fly advanced, I'm happy to um, evaluate you. That's sort of what I've, the conclusion I've come to. <laughs> that's that's good, uh, good advice and good insight on the uh, the industry overall. And it's, it's great to hear how regulated it is you know sometimes there's over regulation but it sounds like in this case it's really in the interest of safety yeah. and, it's, it, and it's working clearly yes i think it is so yeah this is uh, <laughs> one of my favorite shots we uh shot with you down in florida off the coast and one of your uh, students and doug's uh, extra yeah, Doug's extra he he just came back from a contest where he flew advanced so i'm really proud of him i said okay now you can go out and fly your air show routine and all of that all right so i'll have somebody i can't He's kind of a team member, so I have a another guy evaluate him, but I'll I'll help him. So yeah. yeah. I think we were out. Uh, you were out doing uh, hammerhead maneuvers that day. That's going up for a uh, a hammerhead turn. And see how I'm looking at you. You know, I'm looking at the other plane, right? It's or a, no, was... no, camera mount. I'm sorry, but see how I'm looking left. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So my students, you know, when I teach them hammerheads, they're always looking straight ahead. I'm like, what are you looking at? You know, <laughs> <laughs> look at the wind. <laughs> so one of the topics I wanted to cut over to next is aerobatic airplanes, talking a little bit about what makes them unique and and uh, what you're looking for and things students should look for also when they maybe choose an airplane or things that you'll point out to them at your flight school as well. Sure. So these two slides are, the, these airplanes are not built for aerobatics. One is a seven, the first 707, the other is a, a Shrike Commander. And what makes these planes unique are the pilots. <laughs> and that's Bob Hoover, who everybody knows is like one of the all time greats, if not the greatest pilot ever. And he really, really was, really was. And uh, and I knew him very well um, and flew many shows with him. And the other plane is uh, flown by Tex Johnson. And let me see, now I have that 
picture right behind me. What year was that? Was that 50? I'm going to pull it up here. It was um, 1955, Sunday, August 7th. Uh, over, he flies the 367-80, which is a 707, over Seattle's Lake Washington. He was demoing the plane for potential airline buyers. And he rolled it three times, did barrel rolls in it three times. They're not barrel rolls, big aileron rolls. So. And I got to meet him once. I was at a show. I was just starting out, and I had the Astro 230, and I was at Everett, Washington. And um, this real tall guy comes walking across. I was standing by myself. This real tall guy with a big belt buckle, he must have been about 6'6", six, six, and walked up and he had one of those rodeo belt buckles on. And he said, hi, I just want to say hi. And I'm like, oh, hi. And he goes, I'm Tex Johnson and just introduced himself and I didn't know who he was. And he said, oh, I'm pilot with Boeing or something like that. And that was probably in 1989 or something like that. And um, I'm like, oh, great. And then I found out who he was later, you know, and he, he was so nice. So I'm I'm so excited that I can <laughs> <I> meet him. <laughs> but these planes aren't, so you don't want to go out and roll these planes yourself. You know, it's off limits to most people. These planes, Super D and the Extra, fine. Uh, start in the Super D Cathlon, then go to the Extra. These are great training airplanes. We love the, We put a lot of time in the Super D Cathlon. We're thinking about getting another one. It's just so busy. It's such a great trainer. You know, if you only have access to an Extra, go for it. But but everything's a little slower in the decathlon. It's sort of like the Chevy and the Ferrari kind of deal, you know. Learn to fly in the, learn to drive in the Chevy, and then get your dad to buy you a Ferrari. It's never <laughs> happened to me, you know. But <laughs> that's a good life goal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so um, you know, you yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, they're those. That's the way it goes. But <laughs> start with the underpowered one. All right. Uh, well, yeah, what makes these airplanes aerobatic? Um, well, first, they're they are designed for aerobatics. Um, they're very, very safe. They're very proven. The decathlon, for example, is really it comes from the Champ lineage. So, and that was around in the 30s. So, it's it's it was just built. It's almost kind of a Champ in a way, which you know, it went from the Champ, then they built a Tabria, and then they did some models Tabria, then they came out with the 150 horse decathlon, and they just kept sort of building on. They really haven't made that many changes. Um, you know, the wing's a little different, and they, they've improved the ailerons, but it's a proven, proven design. So um, these airplanes, most aerobatic planes um, have a steel tube uh, fuselage um, frame. And there are a few, a couple, um, like the MX that Rob Holland flies is a monocoque construction, so it's all composite. Um, but most of them have steel tube frame. It's pretty standard. Um, they all have tail wheels. Um, there are a couple of trainers. There's this Lynn 242 aerobatic trainer, which is very nice. It has very similar performance to decathlon, um, but they're pretty rare. You can't really find them. And so most of the time you're going to have a Stabria decathlon, something like that to train in for aerobatics. Uh, the tail wheel is less draggy than a nose wheel plane. So, um, you know, doing aerobatics and nose wheel planes is really draggy out there. It's a real energy hog. And so you want that um, tail wheel back there. It's much easier to work on and so on and so forth. And so get your tail wheel rating if you're planning to solo and buy an aerobatic plane. And insurance companies want some tail wheel time. They're not going to insure you if you have no tail wheel time. Um, they might want 25 hours. They might want 50 hours. So in fact, somebody came up to me just today and said, you know, I think I might want to buy a decathlon someday. And I said, how much tail wheel do you have? And they said, none. I said, go work, go find a champ, go find a cub, start working on it now because you won't get insurance. Um, symmetrical airfoil is really important. Um, camber is really important. There's wing design. Um, if you look at the top one, the uh, top, if you draw a line through it, the, uh, through the middle of it, through the cord, the top and the bottom of the wing is the same. Um, a traditional airfoil like the 172s you can see is totally different. So uh, most aerobatic planes have very sym symmetrical or close to symmetrical airfoils. And then when they put them on the plane, there can be an angle of incidence that's a little different. You know, if you look at the extra, you say, oh, it's it doesn't look completely, you know, flat and symmetrical. I'm like, that's because it's put on with a little bit of an incidence for whatever reason. So. Uh, um, no flaps, absolutely. Um, we don't need flaps, we just slip. Um, huge ailerons, not just large, but huge ailerons. The ailerons on the decathlon aren't this big, but on the extra, 
as you can see, they're almost full span. So when I introduce somebody to the X-ray, I walk up to them and I say, well, you know, what are the things on this airplane that you see um, that are, can you hear me okay? Yeah, oh, it's we my can. internet. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, um, but, okay, good. So I, I um, tell people, you know, what's what are some of the unique things about this plane? You know, you, you want to look at a plane you're going to fly. And I'm like, look at the ailerons. Have you ever seen ailerons this big? <laughs> and they go, oh my God, I'll never be able to control it. And I'm like, no, no, it's fine. So yeah, that's that's a feature that you'll see in a lot of these. Uh, sight gauge, yeah, that's uh, you know some airplanes don't have it. That's okay. You can you can learn to use the wing, but it's a little cheater, and it can be it's really good for ultra precision if you just want to be perfectly 45 degrees like you need to be in competition or perfectly vertical. Um, it's it's really nice. Look at this. We're up we're upside down. Yeah, we upside down. No, we're we're diving, and see the sight gauge on the that's level with the horizon. It's above the horizon, but it's level with it. And that's 45 degrees. What are we doing there? I'm trying to figure out where. I think it's coming off of a Cuban. OK, yeah. So, But you can see that line is, is uh, parallel to the 45 degrees, no, to the horizon, I'm sorry. Uh, flop tube and fuel tank. Um, yeah, so all these planes have a header tank. Um, that is a little tank attached to either both fuel tanks or an aerobatic tank, what's called, depends on the system and the design. And there, it's very, very simple. Um, there is a flop tube inside. So when you roll upside down, the flop tube goes like this and it's able to pick up the fuel. That's all it is. So pretty simple. You've got to replace them every so often. Verto oil system is pretty simple too. All it is, is it has a ball that when you roll upside down stops the oil from running out and keeps the engine running sometimes you see you know you'll see the oil pressure go like this it's you know up and down it's normal but um the most common one like the one in this picture is a christian oil system and it's just super simple just a basically a, um, a shuttle valve with a ball in it and stops it stops the oil from puking out uh, G meter, yeah, they're required in aerobatic planes. Um, I use G meters a lot when, you know, what we all do here when we're training to show people, oh, you didn't pull enough Gs to get that loop up and over the top. Um, so G meters are important. And when I'm teaching somebody how hard to pull, you know, it's a feel thing. You get used to feeling how hard to pull and what Gs feel like. It takes a while. Um, I'll have them reset the G meter every maneuver sometimes um, if they're having trouble with it and say, okay, what do you, would you do this time? How much is this time? So it's a real good training tool. And I use it in my air shows all the time. Um, you know, I know how amped up I was that day. <laughs> and if it's a really cold day, you know, and the air is really good and you're really honking, you're like, oh, gee, you know, I'm at the limit. Amazing. I think after the uh, latest Top Gun, everybody was talking about G's and the, and the airplanes there as they were overstressing the airplanes on that. Uh, famous pool maneuver as their oh, right. Uh, right. What were they? I can't remember where they're supposed to be pulling. I don't know. It was a big number, bigger, more than ten. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. They're macho. What do you uh, What do you see in in your air show? Typically, what's your max? I can do, I uh, you know, nine, ten, yeah, and then minus four, maybe. Yeah, Top so, Gun was hard for me. Was, <laughs> so I I went with two or three friends, you know, and and um. I was like, oh, come on, you know, I was making these like comments from the peanut gallery. And <laughs> finally, the guy sitting next to you is a really good friend. He said, Patty, this is not a documentary. And I'm like, okay, I go, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I changed my thinking. I just sat back and I'm like, okay. It, but it was hard to, it was a hard, it was hard. But to you go. enjoyed it, right? You liked the movie? Yeah, 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 yes and no. There were some shots in it I like. I didn't like the movie that much, but I, I there were some, and that's just me. You know, I know a lot of people really loved it, but I didn't like the first one that much either. So you know, but I love the the flying shots, and there yeah. were some good in the first one. And um, my ex boyfriend flew in the first one, so that was cool. And um, so you know, I did like that one, but. Um, and then the second one, I like the, you know, like the low level over the desert and stuff like that. That was cool. There was some cool, cool stuff. Yeah, I know you're uh, uh, Kevin LaRosa, your uh, family friends with uh, some of the production crew that filmed that. Some really impressive. Yeah. And that's the way I looked at it, too, from the production side. Uh, yeah. How yeah they the, that off. the um, Kevin LaRosa and his son, you know, and I remember I tried to catch up with the Manashkash. Didn't they come looking for me at the Sporties tent? Yep. 
and uh, we never could catch up. And um, so I worked with Kevin and you know TV and commercials and stuff. And so, yeah, they're they're doing they did amazing work in that. Really, really proud of them. I've got one other off-topic question that came in that we have to ask here while the G meter's on. Uh, I'm going to read this verbatim. Does Remy like negative Gs, and how physically demanding is top level for Remy to stay in G shape to handle your negative Gs? That's a great question because I get asked that a lot. Um, negative Gs are something you don't want to fool with. They are really hard, and you really have to keep in shape for them. And that just means getting in the cockpit and pushing, you know, pushing, which is outside maneuvers. And I'll tell you, when I was competing, um, that's where it's really hard. Doing air shows, nobody cares whether you do a lot of negative Gs, you know. And um, it'll take me every spring getting into air show season, it'll take me about six months to really, really get in condition for negative Gs and really feel good pushing them. Um, you know, I've pushed negative Gs before that. I get up to speed pretty quick, but um, but it's 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 brutal. And it's it takes a long time, and you just have to – you just have to do it every day, you know, or five days a week. It's kind of a full-time job. It can break blood vessels. I did had that this year. I had a picture of like my whole eye was red. People are like, what happened to you? I'm like, I don't know, you know, too many Gs, but, you know, and uh, I was just getting ready for air show season. That's all for Sun and Fun. And so it's a, it's a, it's a lifestyle choice, whether you're going to do it or not. Now you can go out and push a little bit. It's not going to hurt, but you know, you don't want to push hard and, you know, it can cause some other problems, so it's it's tough. But it's um, it feels good once you get in condition for it. You know, it just takes a long time. Right. <laughs> Some, you know, in the summer, honestly, when I'm pulling hard and it's a really hot day and I feel like a little like a little lightheaded, you can feel the blood all rushing down, and you know, you're trying hard to not let that happen. But sometimes I'll just roll inverted and push to get the blood back in my head and then sort of gently come out of that, and that that you know, like instant, you know works instantly it's fun yeah. <laughs> um, so i noticed all your students wear parachutes and you do as well uh, when you're out doing the lessons yeah far you have it here uh, not that i had it memorized 91307 um yeah i think with just upset training you don't have to and you can do spin training without parachutes but we always you know all that's another feature of aerobatic planes um is an egress system so in the decathlon there's a, a pin that you can pull that releases the drawer hinges so you can get out and in the extra you just open the canopy and flight it's designed to come off um so and all the aerobatic planes have that that kind of system so i'm like why not you know i mean first you know the league you can go up alone without a parachute but you can't take a passenger or a student with you without a parachute so unless you're just doing some kind of basic upset stuff upset training so you know you're like why not you know have you ever had to bail out of an airplane I almost had to bail out once. I considered it very strongly. And, you know, for years, I didn't take it that seriously, even though I've seen a couple of people bail out and I've known people that have successfully bailed out. I've got one, two, three, four people, five people, maybe friends of mine. So um, I, you know, you never think you're going to bail out. So I, I, I haven't taken it real seriously. I guess for, for a long time I didn't. And then I started to take it more seriously and look and go, look, this isn't just a seat cushion. You know, you got to make sure your leg straps are tight and they're in the right place, you know, and that you're not going to come out of this thing if you have to use it. And I almost had to use it um, about a year and a half ago. And not in an extra or anything like that, uh, just another plane. And, um, you know, I was able to get the plane down, but I and successfully, you know, walked out. But it well, it opened my eyes a little bit, you know. Take it, take it seriously. And I know I've been yeah. doing this, time, you know, but but nobody ever thinks they're gonna have to use it. It's kind of a joke. And when the students get in the plane, they're like, "Oh, well, you're, we're gonna bail out today, are we?" I'm like, "Well, only in the, you know, like probably a midair would be probably the most likely. Um, we're pretty careful about traffic, but that would be the most likely reason. Um, and." You know, you better make it work because you can, you'll survive if you, if you use it, you know, so take it seriously. So when you go out and a student comes up with you down to Florida and goes up flying for the first time, where do you practice the aerobatics? Is there uh, airspace limitations or preferred altitudes and airspeeds? What, what all factors into that thought? Well, um, you can, 
so aerobatics, first of all, the rules, we're lucky. We have three practice areas, three or four practice areas that we can go to. And sometimes there's two or three planes up in the air and we say, okay, I'm going north, I'm going west, I'm going south. So um, the rules for doing aerobatics, number one, you have to be 1,500 feet above the ground. We go much higher, but that's the lowest you can go without being in a wavered practice box, like the one that we have here at the airport. Um, and that's a special thing that's been wavered and approved by the FAA well, well in advance. So 1,500 feet, uh, three miles visibility, um, and uh, the big one is not within four nautical miles of an airway. That's, I, am I missing one? But the, the four airways are very, a federal airway. There are a lot of airways out there, but they're not all federal or considered federal airways. Um, and we've done a lot of research in that because, you know, people said, well, you're flying on this airway. And I'm like, nope, it's not a federal airway. Um, and the FAA agrees with it. So um, those are the biggies, you know, three miles, 1,500 feet. And oh, not over congested airspace. So not over the middle of a city, you know, or, you know, you, you want to be respectful of that. That's really important. People get nervous when they see a plane diving at them, you know. I don't sure, blame sure. Them. Yeah. What, what kind of speeds are you flying that are in some of the basic maneuvers? Well, we keep it within the limits of the airplane. The, the decathlon, we usually don't go over 160. Um, you can go faster, but that's the yellow line. So we keep it, we keep it there. That's about as fast. Um, and of course we go zero and negative zero in some of the, you know, when we're doing some of the stuff, um, the extra has a bigger envelope, so it can go up to 220 knots and there's really no yellow line. You can, you know, you can just fly it. We don't get that fast with students. We don't need to occasionally. Um, but you know, 180 is a really good top speed for it for a student. And so, yeah. And down to zero and minus zero. What's uh, what's your favorite aerobatic maneuver to fly? Um, so I, you know, honestly don't have a favorite. It's, I mean, I love hammerheads, you know, and I love vertical rolls. I, I love vertical stuff. But my favorite maneuver to do in an air show is the hardest maneuver I do, and that's this rolling, snap rolling 360. It's really hard to do. It takes a lot of practice. I get dizzy if I don't practice it every day. You know, when I start training and um, and it's hard and nobody else does it. So I like that, you know, about it. And, um, and it took me a long time to perfect it. So you're rolling and snap rolling, which is stalling and rolling. And the stall makes the plane go faster and roll in a turn while you're rolling and I'm keeping it level. That's really hard. That's a hard part. I can't, the altimeter isn't accurate. So it's bouncing around. It's going about about a 200 foot bounce in the altimeter. And I'm going up and down a little bit. So I use 200 feet as my benchmark. I'm like, okay, if it starts descending more than that, then I got to look out and really figure out if something, you know, if I'm not doing it right, am I getting too slow, that kind of thing. So I use that. And then you're rolling and turning and it's fun, you know, it's it's crazy and um, and it's people like it. so. Uh, that's my favorite maneuver. And and also just rolling turns in themselves are so fun. You just you roll and you turn. You can roll to the outside. You can roll to the inside. You can swap the roll in the middle and change directions. You can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. We had a, uh, a 360 camera one day out when you were doing that. And I don't think we ever planned on shooting it, but you were out doing it for fun. And we yeah. uh, we locked the footage down and it looked like a washing machine. Is <laughs> it really? Around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, you should send me a clip. We will. It's on our, uh, we have a clip on the YouTube, uh, Sporty's YouTube channel, if you search on there. Uh, I think we put okay. it up a couple of years ago, but if anyone wants to see it, uh, it's it's a horizon stabilized shot of, of Patty doing the rolling turns, which was new to me at the time, and I was one of the craziest things I've ever seen, so check that out. Um, how to get started. Well, of course, you have to take lessons, and it's not just a plug for me, but a plug for other schools, too. Um, and honestly, I would say watch the Sporties video. That is everything that we teach. And and the first part of the basic aerobatic video is all about aerobatics. Um, if you're interested in aerobatics, it's the history, you know, the types of planes, uh, where you can see aerobatics, what the difference between competition and air shows is. It's I I was I really happy with how that came out. And because we we went to the EAA museum and we shot some of it there with some of their famous airplanes. And so I, I think that's really, I think it's important that you understand what you're getting into and what the history of it is. Um, so, and then everything else on there is all basic maneuvers and it really, it, you, you can really feel like you've flown through everything before you get started. Um, to find an aerobatic school, I recommend IAC. 
uh, IEC.org. And I don't think you have to be a member to, you might be, but I don't think so to access their aerobatic school directly, directory. Um, and they even publish it and leave it at the, like the IEC tent at Oshkosh and leave it out for people. So I'm pretty sure you can just access it, but they're really good at um, identifying people in your area. <clears throat> so look there. Um, and then also do some other checking, you know, ask people, ask around, how's this person, you know, how's their airplane? Did they keep their airplane up? You know, most of the time it's fine, uh, especially if they're in the IEC, but, um, you know, ask around, go out and look at it. Is it clean? You know, is it, is it, uh, you know, they washed it in the last year? If not, eh, maybe not, but most of them will look okay. So um, how long is a course? Um, again, 10 hours is our benchmark for when people should solo. I mean, it's up to them. We don't solo them in our planes, but, you know, we say, yeah, now you're, you're probably good to go up and do something up really high. Um, and, um, you know, five hours is a really good course too. And that's what the Sporties video is based on, the five hour course. So, <clears throat> uh, really depends on what your goals are. And you can learn a lot in one day also. Um, yeah, we have a welcome letter that we can send out to anybody that um, asks us for it. It's also on my website, pattywagsap.com. So if you go down to the training, you look at the school, go to the welcome letter, and there's a lot of information in there. Um, you know, how to dress, you wanna dress really comfortably. Um, I recommend just like, you know, joggers or sweatpants, shorts, um, no belts or anything really fussy because you have all, you know, you got the parachute and then you have this, giant harness with two seat belts on it with a, one has a ratchet on one side and so you know anything that's going to push against you is uncomfortable so you know we get people are pretty laid back when they come here we want them to wear their most laid back clothes t-shirts i we we get a lot of people that are you know bu serious business owners and i know they don't dress like this all the time and they they're, they're super relaxed it's really fun for them you know because that's the way you got to dress um and let me see what was the uh, i had the thing in the way here how did i get over the initial nerves well we have therapy puppies and um <laughs> so everybody's nervous um in fact i've been training a new instructor who's who's just wonderful and um she um you know one of the things i said to her when she first started she she's been with us a while now but um i said you have to understand that everybody that walks through the door for the first time has anxiety, you know, and everybody's nervous and it's our job to make them feel comfortable. And, and if they don't have anxiety, I mean, I would, I did, everybody does, you know, you're doing something new with people you don't know and it's the first time you can do aerobatics. And so um, it's a, it's a big thing with us and we try and make them laugh and be comfortable and our instructors are really fun and, you know, we don't, we don't wear epaulets and we don't wear flight suits. You know, we are laid back, chill, but professional. And, you know, um, and then we do have therapy puppies too, which really helps, <laughs> seriously. But we, well, we tell people, look, don't worry. You're gonna go up for fun. You're gonna, the first, the, you know, your first hour in the plane isn't gonna be a lot of aerobatics. You, we're not gonna throw you into some kind of a lump back or something. Deep terms. And when I tell them that, they're like, oh, okay, okay, cool. You know, you're just going to start with the basic stuff. And then we'll, you know, you probably do a roll on the first flight. So, yeah. I think a common question. That's it. I, That's I, how I we do it. And then when they come in, I see them petting the puppy. <laughs> Is that the Remy? Uh oh. Can you hear us? Oh, yeah. No, yeah, no. They're quiet right now. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, so, you common. Hear? Okay, can... it's back. Oh. Common question we get is motion sickness. Uh, what's your suggestions for somebody who may be more prone to this, and and how to kind of build up the tolerances? And what do you what do you do before and after a flight to help a student with it? Everybody, everybody asks about that. It's a big thing. Uh, we've done a lot of research. We can't find much. There's not much out there on motion sickness. They basically don't know. And we have two students who are neurosurgeons that we have asked. And if anybody would know, they would know. And they, you know, the the common description is. Uh, it's when your brain is, there's a difference between what your brain sees and what you know you should be doing, you know, that it's not upright, oh my God. Um, but there's more to it than that. So um, we find that most people, if they get motion sickness, we, we really eliminate, we really try and keep things, 
easy and light on the first flight and we're aware of all the signs like you know people get quiet they start sweating stuff like that and we're like okay we'll go back we'll keep it short and we'll make it up on the other flights you know not to worry you're going to get your full hours and all that but um keep it short look for signs and talk to them about you know we we, we give them advice ahead of time don't eat don't eat spaghetti in the morning right or greasy pork chops like eat a bagel but eat something light a muffin don't drink orange juice just you know drink something light coffee's fine but you know just keep it light and then <clears throat> um and then we give them a relief band that they put on that they can turn on that seems to really help too i know you, i bought them through through you guys um and so and you know we're real careful um and if they start feeling sick and then they say i'm okay now they're they're not okay now you know once once they start feeling sick you have to knock it off so so we just let them fly around a little bit sometimes they fly around 15 minutes um and everybody's different most people get over it after the first or second flight and then they feel great so and that's most people probably 95 98 percent some people have a little bit more they have to overcome but you know then then i'm starting to think it might be a vestibular problem so i read a, i read some research recently it said um, they really didn't know, you know, basically it was by, you know, scientific research done by, you know, I forget who, but, um, and one thing they said that they found with people who get motion sickness is their diets had more histamines in them than other people. And, and some of the things that they recommended not eating, uh, I have to think of it, were like sausage, um, red wine, um, there were, oh gosh, um i have it written down but there were some things on there and um see if I, I can't find it right now but um so f there a lot of foods are high in histamines but there are some that are particularly high so i might put that in our welcome letter and say you know i don't know but you know yes yeah, sounds like a combination of things and best practices and uh, to some extent yeah it's a good a practice too a lot of it is anxiety i really believe that you know that's why we really can minimize it I know we covered some of these uh, topics already, uh, but uh, this picture is fun because it made me think of when we were shooting this. This was, I think, in the middle of COVID or right after where you were going out for a practice routine and we loaded up your camera or your uh, airplane with a bunch of cameras That's and you... A single seater, isn't it? Is yeah, it? you talked, I think so, because you talked through an entire aerobatic sequence uh, oh, yeah, with audio. Yeah, that was two seater. That was really fun. That was in Doug's plane. Doug's, yeah. So. I, I, reference people to Sporty's YouTube channel. Uh, if you go on there and just search for Patty's name, we've got all kinds of videos on there. Um, but this is a cool one to check out because you go through an entire routine and it was fascinating for us to see too in the uh, aerobatic box. Sorry to interrupt you. I, I got so many comments on that, Brett. I, I still do. And that was so popular and people were really fascinated by it. Um, just the whole thing, it was so beautiful. Like, look at the scenery. It and is. The cameras and, you know, it was just the, the quality of the film and talking through it. And I, I, I swear I got more comments on that than anything. We should we should roll it out again or do another one. Do another one, right? Uh, for those today, though, go, uh, right? go check it out on our uh, go, our YouTube channel. Yeah. It's like yeah. maybe 15 or 20 minutes or so, but uh, it's just cool to hear your insight and what you're thinking as you're going through, you know, a full routine along the way. The thing that people have said are, because I said, look, because I only flew one show that year and we all joked because we said how much did you have to pay to fly this show because we all were so <laughs> different the show you know right. and um, so that was uh i was practicing you know but that was early in the season earlier like in the middle of summer and that show was later but anyway i one of the points i made i said it doesn't matter if you fly 10 shows a year 20 or one show you still have to stay in shape for it you can't wait till the week before the show because it takes months to get your tolerance and um, so a lot of people talk to me about that later. That's cool. A yeah. uh, couple last things here. I'm going to call out and have a couple more questions for you. Uh, a couple websites to oh, yeah. jot down. There's a uh, Patty on the flight line uh, next to Southeast Aero down at St. Augustine. Her uh -huh. website, very simple, pattywagstaff.com, but lots of great information on her courses, uh, both upset recovery and the full aerobatic courses. And then, of course, more information on the course Patty talked about. And, you know, we, we met up with Patty at Sun and Fun. This is probably five or six years ago. And she was mm -hmm. looking for a way. Yeah. I, I know it's been that long. 
to uh, to to have a program that she could send her students ahead of time before they came to her school to be prepared what to expect. Um, and you know, today's presentation is more of an intro and understanding this course goes into stick and rudder and you know what speeds to fly, where to move the controls, that kind of thing. So it's it's kind of like your uh, pre-course before you actually show up there and you make get sure some that. Yeah, and people love it. And then you know they can come and watch it here. Everybody it seems like everybody gets it ahead of time now. And but when they're here, I'm like. I use it a lot for training. I'm like, why don't you go into the other room and review the loop before we go fly? And with tailwheel, it's super important to review because some people combine tailwheel with our 10 hour course. And I'm like, go in there and review the landing part because that's what you're having trouble with or something. And they do. And I almost don't, you know, you don't have to do a lot of briefing after that because they, and it's fresh. So it's really a good training tool. And it's good for tailwheel. Good. Pilot. You know, I've had tailwheel pilots say, you know, I don't fly a lot of tailwheel. I'm getting back into it, but I used your video, your tailwheel video as a review. So, and probably the same with aerobatics you could do, you know, so definitely you could do that, you know, review stuff. Yeah, and, right. and we show, what I really like about it um, is that we show inverted system and non-inverted system. Because, you know, I, I realized after we started doing this that a lot of people have RVs and planes, like Stearmans that don't have an inverted system. And so that's why we put the RV in here and we show you all the maneuvers without an inverted system. And some of them are a little different. Um, so that's a, uh, let's segue into our uh, Q&A here because I have a handful of questions. Um, okay. Uh, John asks, actually, he has an RV7. Um, he's asking, does that have a flop tube and can you fly inverted or how do you fly 1G maneuvers for non-inverted airplanes? Watch the video because it's on there and it'll show you exactly how to do those maneuvers and what power settings should be and how you how you do them. Does it have a flop tube? I don't know if you have an inverted system or not. It won't have one if you don't have it. That's part of an inverted system. Um, probably not um, because you'd probably know if you had an inverted system. So, But you know, you can have a lot of fun with that one. You don't have to hang there inverted and hold it level or anything like that. You can still do a lot of, you know, have a lot of fun and all the basic maneuvers are, are on the course and you can always write us and ask us questions if you need to or, you know, whatever. Find somebody to fly with. Yeah, good point. And that's that's in the course we show the the Cathlon or extra and then the RV. And I know you, you illustrate the differences uh, with with the technique used to make sure that fuel is flowing to the engine the entire time. Differences too. Yeah. So. We've got a question uh, from a gentleman uh, who is six foot tall, three inches, one hundred ninety pounds. He wants to know if he will fit in an extra. Yes, he will fit just fine in an extra. Um, most people start with the student in the front seat because they don't. Um, the, they don't have the controls that you have in the back seat. Six foot threes, unless you know, unless you have a really long inseam and you're, all, you know, really leggy, you should be able to fit just fine. When you transition to the back seat, that, you know, Jimmy Graham, the football player, yeah. he's he's got an extra. He's six foot seven. I mean, he's really tall, maybe six foot eight. He's somewhere in there. He has an extra. So if he can fly it, you can fly it. How about that same person in a pits? Yeah, I think so. Yep, I've seen real tall people in pizzas, yes. Now, the front seat can be a little tight. We have a guy who's 6'5", wants to fly with us, and when they're that tall, I say, go find an extra and see how you fit in the front seat. Because until, you know, everybody's ergonomic, you know, at, different. Uh, some people have longer legs, longer torsos, and, you know, you got to kind of go. So, he, so he's looking for, he's looking for one near Park City. If anybody has an extra near Park City, huh. please, please contact me and let me know. Out in uh, Utah? Yeah, sorry, nice. Parks. Uh, yes, so he's looking for an extra so he can go sit in the front seat to see if he can come fly with us. Gotcha. Uh, on the geographic topic, uh, somebody's asking, can you recommend an extra instructor or flight school in upstate New York? Uh, let me think about it. I know the pits in upstate New York. I have to think about it. Um, feel free to email me at uh, pattyaerobatics at gmail.com. And also, and, and let me think about who's up there. Uh, you know, you can, upstate New York, there might be, we'll, I'll look. Okay. Uh, which seat, and you kind of alluded to this, but we'll ask the question again, which seat should a student sit in in a tandem airplane? We put our students in the front seat, almost always. Uh, if we're giving somebody like sort of an intro kind of flight, we don't do a lot of that. We'll put them in the back seat, you know, but if they're going to be flying the plane, they're definitely in the front seat. The instructor's in the back seat. It's really important for them to be up there and be able to 
operate the controls and look at the, you know, all the end. You can't see anything from the back seat. We're virtually blind. I mean, I can see a little bit, but that's about it. Um, and uh, the is there a minimum hours? Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. You're going to finish. You're going to finish your oh, thought. I'll come back to my question. On the front seat, it's a little different because, you know, you solo it from the back seat. Um, but we put the student on the front seat mainly because there's no mixture up, you know, the mixtures in the back seat, the props in the back seat. If somebody's getting an extra checkout, um, then we'll um, we'll put them in the front seat to start with. Well, we actually put them in the back seat of the decathlon to start with, so they can have a view like the extra with no, you know, they ha you have to use peripheral vision because you can't see in front of you. So we put them in the back seat, the extra, then we put them in the front seat, then we put them in the back seat. Once we know that they're solid and they're not going to do anything dumb, then we put them in the back seat of the extra because there's a little more risk in the front seat when you don't have a mixture control, right? You know, sure. so the prop, people do funny things. So, yeah. What's but um? If, if it's a student, uh, sorry, I'm blabbing on forever, but if it's a student who, um, is only going to do one or two hours in the extra with us, and we just keep them in the front seat. So. Okay. Is there a minimum hours you look for a pilot before they start a program there? No. In fact, we get student pilots sometimes that are nervous about their training. They don't feel they're getting enough, you know, and they, they want to become more confident, and they come and do our one-day confidence course. So, no. There's no minimum. Now, yeah, you know, we want you to be a pilot or close to being a pilot. We don't just take give rides or anything, but um, not at all. Yeah, sometimes sometimes lower time pilots are better because they don't have any bad habits. Right, or, right. Or many bad habits, you know. So yeah. It's a question. Uh, do women have a more difficult time with aerobatics? I haven't seen any difference. You know, people say, oh, women are much smoother. Eh, they're all the same. You know, women are better at G's. No, not really. Um, you know, I, I. it's a matter of desire. You know, if you you want to do it, you know, go and learn how to do it. But I, I really haven't seen any difference um, between men and women at all as far as you know, that if they're motivated, um, but I, I honestly, and I look for it, honestly, you know, I, I, I thought maybe women were better at air sickness, but I haven't, they're about the same. Um, so it's, it's not a gender thing, you know, at all. I've really looked, you know, but we did just hire our first female flight instructor and she's wonderful and I'm so excited. So. Good. Yeah, yeah no, you have a, a great, uh, great uh, crew of instructors there, and I've met most of them, but I, yeah, I haven't, haven't met her yeah. yet, but look, look forward to that. You'll really like her. She's very good. Got one final question, and this one's a fun one. What is the coolest aircraft you've ever flown? The P-51 Mustang is the coolest airplane I've ever flown for, for all above all the above reasons, history, engine, you know, performance, excitement, the fact that I'm flying somebody's you know, $3 million airplane or whatever. Yeah, all all of that, definitely. But the Tucano is pretty cool too, I have to say. It's very, very sporty, has very similar performance to a Mustang and it's it's it has air conditioning, so. <laughs> nice. Well, Patty, uh, thank you very much for your time today. Any final words you wanna share with the, the group looking to? Uh, you know, yeah, aerobatics isn't crazy stuff. The stuff we do at air shows isn't crazy stuff. It's very controlled, it's very fun. And it's not for everybody. I know that, but you kind of owe it to yourself to get a day of training, of upset training, maybe little aerobatics, and you know, just just to try it. If if you're going to be a pilot, you know, once they knew they did the wrong thing because they they lived long enough to tell everybody what happened and it was extremely sad and unnecessary and um, all they did the wing dipped and they panicked and they pulled back and the plane flipped over the other way and got upside down and you know went into the ground the passenger survived but um it was so like avoidable you know and if they just taken a day course somewhere and so you know think about that so thank you that's great advice well, get, uh, Patty, thanks again for your time and, and all you do for aviation. We look forward to seeing you at the Sporties exhibit at Oshkosh this summer. Uh, pass along to anyone here who will be at Oshkosh. Thanks. That's one of my favorite places to hang out. I'll put it on my schedule ahead of time. So come and see me there, okay? You guys, whoever's yeah, on there. 
Thank you, Brett. Great time. And, and tell, uh, make sure to tell Patty you were here for the webinar. And as I mentioned earlier, the recording will be up tomorrow, sporties.com slash webinars and on our YouTube channel uh, for some exciting and, like I mentioned earlier, a wide variety of kind of teaser videos and some of her performances mic'd up in the cockpit. Check out our channel. Just search for Patty on there and you'll find all kinds of fun stuff. Patty, thanks again. And on behalf of Sporties and Patty's uh, Flight School in Florida, have a great afternoon and we'll see you on the next Sporties webinar. Thanks, Patty. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Bye.